remember when I first gave my life to Christ, I didn't really care where I knelt down. I did it right there in my chair. And uh, I love that. There was a time where even during the invitation at the end of service, I'd find myself laying prostrate there at the altar, face down, just wanting more of him, more of Christ. And um, I remember going through a difficult time once, and the minister, who's since gone to be with the Lord, Brother Hood, Pastor Hood, he was an old country preacher, preached a really strong message about a field and plowing, and it's really good. Right there at the end, I had no earthly idea what the Holy Spirit was going to do, but he asked everybody just to turn around in their chairs and just pray right there on your knees. And I don't know what happened, but I started crying so hard. And uh, had a brother come up behind me, and, and he was praying. I don't know what he was saying. I was, couldn't hear over my sobbing. And uh, when I opened my eyes, to my amazement, a pool of my saliva that was coming out of snot, <laughs> just pooling in the chair and stringing from my nose, and just a really undignified time of brokenness and prayer and desire. And uh, I think God's people need that place in their lives. You know, we have this kind of a control over the situation mentality and this control over all the aspects of our life. Even the areas that we can't control, we try to keep it together and not act like it's out of control over there. And I think sometimes the Lord just wants us to get before him and be a wreck. Have you ever been a wreck for Jesus just in prayer? You know, where you just, I can't even, Lord, I don't even want to control this stuff. I just want you. I'll tell you right now, there's a lot of folks in America right now that are leaving something for their children. And it's not that great. I don't even know if America is going to be around in the way we see it right now in the next 20 years. 20 years if God's people don't get broken. We haven't been broken. Maybe persecution will come. Maybe what's happening in Canada will come to the United States where if you pass out a gospel track that speaks of Islam, that you'll get arrested. Right now today, our northern border, you start to, to do anything close to what we did a couple of Sundays ago after church and head down there and start ministering to homosexuals, hoping that they'll get saved. One young lady, from everything that I could tell, ended up giving her life to Christ that day at the gay pride parade. Several people were broken. They got to a place of brokenness where they couldn't get away from, from this propensity that's in their lives. But the seed was sown. The seed was sown. If I were to go up, if we went up to uh, Canada right now and did that same thing at a gay pride parade, we'd be arrested. That's how close it is. That's how close it is. Very close. Very close. What will it take for us to break? What will it take for us to have an absolute brokenness for God? I don't want anything else to happen except just do it for me. I want to leave a legacy for my grandchildren that there was a Christian remnant that stood up in the power of God with brokenness for the lost, weeping with tears, preaching and teaching the saving gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, they can look back and say, oh yeah, my granddad, my grandma, 
boy, they something happened there in 2019, 2020 era, and I mean, they turned things upside down. And they call it the last great re- revival. Persecution came against them as soon as they started doing it like we have never seen in America, and they just stood for the word of God in the power of his spirit, and they preached the truth with love. Some of them were killed. Wouldn't that be amazing? I sure hope so. I hope so. What kind of legacy are we going to leave? Cross Life Church, a remnant church, you know, revival starts in one little spot. It starts with the, just one broken person. And then it spreads like fire into other people's lives. I hope we can do that. Amen? Amen. That is my vision for Cross Life. I mean, we've painted a bunch of pictures and we've seen a lot of things, but ultimately it is, it is this Being on fire for the Lord. Being on fire. I'll tell you right now, I'm not on fire for Jesus. I want to be. And sometimes, 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 I am a little bit. But it's nothing like what God has in store for us. And I want that. I want it. I want that. I'll abandon my job. I'll abandon my home. I'll abandon anything if I can get that. Paul said something like that, didn't he? All these things that I had, dung, the King James. I wonder what he actually said. <laughs> it's trash. Everything in this life is trash. But should the Lord tarry, what's going to happen is we're going to have children and grandchildren and their children, and they're going to have something that is just a remnant of of America. We're losing the country, friends. You know that, don't you? Trump's not the answer. Jesus is the answer. Trump's gonna stumble and fall. Now, Trump may not stumble and fall as fast as somebody else might, but uh, he's not the answer. He's not our savior. Jesus is our savior. So God's people are going to have to to rise up, but really, more than anything else, I think it's time that God's people grow up. We have been acting like spoiled brats for too long, living in America as Christians. And it is high time that we get serious and grow up, get away from this childish behavior, and actually get serious because it's serious. I'm not saying that we can't smile and we can't have joy when we're with one another. And I'm not saying that you can't go to a gay pride parade and actually smile and share the gospel with love. Thank you, church, for the prayers before we left. We felt them. They helped to engage. People actually broke as we would talk to them. The work was already being done. Preemptive strike had already hit. (laughs) The ground was softened and we went in. And went in with the joy of the Lord to share the gospel. That's what I'm talking about. We can do that anywhere. In your neighborhood, think about your neighborhood. When was the last time you went door to door to ask somebody uh, about their, uh, tell them about your love for Jesus and your love for their soul? We used to, when we lived in a subdivision, every Thanksgiving time, we'd go around, we'd step out of our door, it depends on where we were, where we were living at the time. Step out of our door, and we would look at all the houses that were around us. And every house that we could see, we went and we baked cookies. We went, knocked on the door, gave them cookies, gave them a gospel track, told them that we loved them, and that at our house we're having a big shindig on whatever night it was, a Friday night or a Saturday night. We're gonna have turkey and ham and all the stuffing and the fixings and everything there. You're invited. And they would come to the house and they would eat and we'd share the gospel and talk with them about the love of Christ and wanna see them saved. 
And several people never talked to us again in our neighborhood. <laughs> and others got saved. And I think that we're too afraid that we're going to be rejected by somebody that we don't even care, care about, really. I mean, if we cared about them, we would at least tell them about Jesus, if we really cared about them. So this is just what I'm talking about, about growing up and realizing what it is. A passage of Scripture that we can go to, uh, this is uh, picking up from a message from a few weeks ago uh, for the vision. We talked about the assembly and the allegiance and then we went off to the gay pride parade and won a soul and planted seeds, amen? And then as far as the, the adaptation, the, the addition, the, the, what, what are we supposed to be adding to our life? How are we supposed to be growing as Christians? The Christ-likeness, the development. 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses... Uh, Two and three. I'm going to read this, and I've got three other passages of Scripture, and then we're just going to talk about this a little bit. Um, man, my desire is for us to be at a place where we love Jesus so much that we don't care about our lives anymore, that we care about the souls of others more than we care about our own freedom, that we care more than we care about our own finances more than we care about our own future in this life. I know that sounds radical. I know it sounds crazy. But when I'm reading through the book of Acts, I'm seeing that kind of radical, crazy Christianity where they're just loving and they don't care about themselves. I think in America, what's happened is we, we wanna have a bunch of money in the bank and we wanna have security and we wanna have the home and we wanna have all these things. And... For what? It's like we store up all these resources here and then we don't use those or, or transfer them into kingdom treasures. And uh, I just saw how they, they just, everything they had. You had two shirts or, or two, two, two coats and you don't have a coat. I've got one coat now. It's that simple. It, it's not, a, there's no debate. There's no wrestling with it. Let me talk to my wife. Let me pray about this. There are certain things you don't have to pray about. You just don't have to pray about it. You just need to be obedient. You just don't have to pray. I got two coats. You only have one. Let me pray about this, and I'll get back to you next week. Hope you make it. No. But we do that kind of stuff all the time. So here it is. here's what it says. As newborn babes, desiring the sincere milk of the word, that you may grow thereby, if so be you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. When I first got saved, I was, I, I couldn't even understand half of what I was reading. I mean, I could understand, but the, the King James was a little bit t tough for me. Um, I, I think I was reading the New King James at the time, and it was an old Bible that I had, and ultimately went to the Christian bookstore and saw all the Bibles that they had. I mean, it, they got the hunting Bible, they got the soldier's Bible, they got the Patriot Bible, they got the NIV, the NSAV, they've got all these Bibles. And I even asking the, the lady that was there, I said, which one is the real Bible? Are they all the same? No, no, they're different translations. I was like, what does that mean? <laughs> well, it means that they're different. So they're not the same. I learned that at Sesame Street. <laughs> Back in the day, you know. And uh, so I started to explore the scriptures to understand I'm going to get a Bible. I want to get a Bible that I'm going to keep and uh, make all kinds of notes in and all that good stuff. And after doing a fairly extensive study and kind of rooting through all the misinformation that's out there as well, because there's a lot of misinformation. There's a lot of information on the internet, a lot of misinformation as well. And you study through, you talk with one person, and they're just like, this is it, this is it. So you start to study through, and ultimately found that there was a division in the scriptures, and, uh, and, and they're different. They're different manuscripts. And so ultimately, you have to, to take that back and see where it originated. And you have two texts, the Byzantine text that comes up out of Antioch, which was the first place that they called them 
Christians, and the other one was the Alexandrian manuscripts, which came out of Alexandria, Egypt, and there aren't a lot of good things that came out of Egypt, a lot of corruption. You had one that was actually called the majority text, and the other one was the minority text. The Alexandria was the minority, and they began to say that because they're so few that this is the more accurate, or maybe it was abandoned over a manuscript that had more, which they called the Textus Receptus, or the majority text. A lot of manuscripts, but there were some real conflicts between the two texts, and I had to decide for myself, and I pray under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, which source text to follow back through to, and I come to find out that The only Bible that we have today that comes from the majority text is the King James Bible. And all the other Bibles that are out there come from the Alexandrian text when it comes to the New Testament, that is. And so you start to explore what the differences are, and I come to find out that the major differences are the removal of Christ from the name Jesus, or his name is not mentioned at all when it says, just believe On him and you shall be saved, it says, and believe and you'll be saved. Just believe. It's okay. So what I saw is in one manuscript, you had Jesus, his deity, removed or diminished. And in the other one, I see it elevated, according to the scripts and the translation, the scripture and the translations. So... Then I was like a newborn babe, desiring the sincere milk of the word. But one of the very first things that I did when I became a Christian is I said, which Bible? Which Bible? Have you ever drank spoiled milk? All nice and chunky and curdly. Up in Oklahoma, my grandparents would do it. They would, they would leave milk on the, I mean, it was, my mom had married and these, my grandparents there and they've since passed, but they would leave milk on the countertop until it got all chunky. And then they'd shake it up, pour it into a glass, and then take some cornbread, good piece of cornbread, crumble it up in there, mix it up, and then eat it, because you couldn't drink this. He's Oklahoma. <laughs> Oklahoma. And I'm not from Oklahoma. Don't, don't, I got to make that clear. <laughs> but so many people today, when they are drinking the sincere milk of the world, word as babes, they don't know any different. They think that's what they're supposed to be drinking. Spoiled rotten word. And it's out there today. Spoiled, rotten word. Now, can you get folks saved the NIV? I could lead you. I could lead you in a Catholic Bible. I could lead you, lead you to, to the Lord in the Jehovah Witnesses Bible. I could. But I'm telling you right now, you want to get, you, you want to study the word of God to prove yourself a workman that is worthy of the cause? You cannot be a healthy Christian with anything other than the King James Bible. I'm just saying that. I'm not a King James only guy. I'm a King James preferred. I will always preach and teach out of this after that study. And I wanna share that with you because as we talk about being infants in Christ and eating the word, I want you to eat a good meal. I want you to grow and be healthy. And I would be derelict as a pastor if I didn't make mention of this. Does it make sense? Praise God. Good. Some folks are angry right now. I hope not. I hope not. You read whatever version you want. You want to be sickly and have curdled milk in your teeth? That's fine. I'll help you pick it out. (laughs) I love you. But I've read some of these other versions, and I'm telling you right now, it's bad. It's bad. I heard one minister that I respected, she said that her favorite version is the Message Bible. 
which is a paraphrased translation of a paraphrased translation of a very well uh, transcribed version of a very corrupt text. <laughs> I try to make this so that you understand the message Bible, you can't memorize it the way it is set up. You're just not. It's all context and it's off. And it's just this paraphrase of a paraphrase of a very good translation of a corrupt source text. And so you want to talk about a mismatch, hodgepodge of thoughts and things like, my goodness. So anyway, that's what she's teaching out of now. I was like, my, oh, my. All right. Next channel. <laughs> so here's another. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12 says, For when for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not strong meat. I have been a Christian for 15 years. I've been a pastor for 10 of those years. People would say, I'm pretty young. Some of the conferences that I go to, they look at my stomach and they say, you must be a young, a new preacher. Because <laughs> for some reason, you're supposed to get a belly, I guess. And I said, uh, well, we won't, we won't go into what I said about that. But I get confused sometimes when I see somebody who's 30 years in the faith and they don't witness, they don't share their testimony, and they don't know nothing about the Word of God. I mean, they know a few things, a few things that they latch on to, but it's, uh, it's tragic, and it's rampant in America, rampant. There are so many folks in churches today. I mean, we should really just walk into some churches and start witnessing for Jesus, I'm telling you, fish are biting. They might be angry. They might be dealing with some Pharisees, I guess. But I'm telling you right now, they don't know anything about the Word of God. They're not studying the Word of God. I'm telling you right now, if you only ate one meal a week, you'd look like a new preacher, a young preacher. You'd be malnourished. It's the same with the Word of God. You should have such a desire for God's word because of the Holy Spirit in you and because of all that he's done for us that every day you should find great joy in opening the scriptures. And if it's just to find something, say, I'm gonna memorize this. I talked with a lady yesterday. And when she was a kid, she was 74. And when she was a kiddo, she was, they had Bible study in school, in the public school, Bible studies. And in school, she memorized the book of Genesis in the public school, the book of Genesis. I thought, wow. And then she started going to some other you know, passages and Psalms that they memorized. And wow, you memorized the foundation of the Bible where all the places of the first mentioning of things happen which are the foundation of other things that are spoken of. That's powerful. I haven't memorized the book of Genesis, but it's inspiring that you can. And what's more inspiring is that it happened in our public school system at one time. You know what you learn in our public school system today? That you can't know what sex you are just yet. Wait a little while till you grow up and you'll figure it out. And we'll help you because dad and dad book is here for you. They're going to teach evolution. Obviously, I just got back uh, from being at, at, uh, with uh, Dr. Kent Hoven. He's doing well, and the place is doing fantastic. And it's amazing in the past couple of years what's developed and the education center that they have going through each day 
of creation is fantastic. The way he connects science with what God's word says, and you just get it. And when you walk away, you walk away saying, the public school system is corrupt to even teach this bogus theory of evolution because it didn't happen. I mean, the basis of it is amazing. Anyway, point, Genesis, read it, understand it, believe it. It's being proved out. Public school system is not doing that for us. So we have to to teach our children. Fathers, happy Father's Day. Raise up your children in the way that they should go. Too many fathers today, sadly, are derelict in their duties of being dads. And it might be uh, innocent that they come by that because their parents only showed them an example that they're following, which involved a lack of concern and care for their spiritual growth. And I'm not gonna blame them because it could have been their parents. And so we're supposed to be training up our children in the way that they should go. Cross Life gets big enough and we got hundreds of folks and we got a bunch of kids running around. It is not my job, it is not a youth pastor's job to raise up those children in the way that they should go. It is the parent's duty. Now, I would like to help shoulder some of the burden and for one hour a week, pour myself into them, have another uh, team of folks pouring themselves into these children only to be an auxiliary to the parents educating their child. And maybe we'll have a co-op class for homeschoolers and teach the Christian values of American history, amen? That's the, that's the class I'd really like to, to teach right out of the gate. That would be awesome. That'd be awesome. And then get somebody to come in and teach science, proper science, evolution, creation. Look at the differences. If you, if you were able to make a choice as a kid, you'd walk away saying, God created everything. I came from, from my father who, who, who planted us here, if you will. Or you walk away and go, well, my granddad, great, great, great grandfather was a rock. <laughs> you take it all the way back, you're gonna have to make a decision. I came from God or I came from a rock. Hmm, takes a lot of faith. I put my faith in the rock of ages. Jesus, amen? Jesus. So let me read this other one. Man, this is taking longer than I thought, but praise God, it's, I, love, I love the word of God. Do you love the word of God? Amen. Amen. amen, good, good, good. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 2, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 2, he says, I have fed you with milk and not with meat. For hitherto you were not able to bear it. Neither yet now are you able. He's talking to the church at Corinth. They had a lot of issues. But he says, I, I fed you with milk, not, not with meat. We haven't gotten serious yet. For hitherto you were not able to bear it. I knew you couldn't do it, and, and you're still not ready, and you're, you're still not ready. So I want to kind of go through something that I thought, and these are just observations with this passage of Scripture. When you think of an infant, an infant has no teeth. They can't really rip into the meat. So they lack the development that's necessary to dive deeper into the word or into meat. I'm gonna make that connection because it's already been made apparent. And then once they start to develop, I mean, even with an infant, there's a lot of things in their body that are still, still you know, getting sorted through as they're growing. 
their digestive system isn't start isn't ready to pray. Even if you put a, a blender, a steak in a blender, and fed it to your baby, the digestive system isn't set up properly yet for that. So they're lacking the development. They're lacking digestion. And then ultimately, at some point, you start to discipline yourself with the food that you eat, right? You start making your own decisions of what you're going to eat. Is it going to be good? Is it going to be bad? Is it going to be too much or is it too little? And you begin to discipline yourself when you eat, how often you eat and how often you don't eat. And so I see that it's very natural progression just based off of observation that somebody comes to faith in Christ and they obviously lack development spiritually and they need somebody to nurture them. Paul says, I have fed you with milk. How many people here are ready to begin feeding people with the milk of the word? Where you can sit there and talk with them and when they say, what just happened? I mean, I know I gave my life to Christ. This big thing. I feel free. What happened? Can you explain that? Because that's milk. That's milk. What do I need to do next? Well, you should get baptized. Tell me about that. Milk. What is this that I'm feeling right now? It's faith. Milk. <clears throat> So, so what does this mean is going to happen? You're going to have a resurrected life. What does that mean? Milk. Are we prepared for the, the basic principles of the oracles of God to minister to folks the milk of the word? Because these are not complicated things. These are the things that we have learned, that we know, that we should be able to feed in a way that they can eat. It's just the milk. We start getting into spiritual warfare and getting into combat and the battle, now we're eating meat. And I'm telling you what, we better be strong with the meat because the battle is hard. It's long. And guess what? The enemy doesn't fight fair. There'll be times where you'll need to fast because that's one of the weapons of our warfare. But until then, the infants don't go to the battlefield. They stay back. And a group of folks nurture them up. Here's what it takes. It requires development, digestion, and discipline of the word, but it takes time. It takes time. You notice in Scripture where it says that even a pastor shouldn't be placed in that position too hastily. Don't be too quick to lay hands on folks. That they shouldn't be novice. It's one of the requirements that he shares with Timothy, that they're not to be novice. Now, I'll tell you right now, some people would say 15 years is novice, especially becoming a pastor after five years of being saved, they would say, that's probably a novice. It depends on how long they've been doing it and how, how much they've, the, the person's been developing and digesting and how disciplined they've become. I've seen some kids that have grew up, man, these are some sharp kids. I mean, they just, they latched onto it. Their academia, whatever it is, I mean, they're just, you know, common sense. It's lacking today. It's not so common, common sense. But it takes time. It takes some time to develop. It also takes some trials. Some trials. See, a faith that isn't worth testing isn't worth having. And you say you've got faith, right? I've got faith. And it starts to get tested, and you start to grumble and complain, get angry with God. Now, sometimes the trials are hard. Sometimes they're heavy. Count it all joy when you find yourself in diverse trials and tribulation. Why? Because it's the testing of your faith. How awesome is it that we say, Lord, I feel like I'm ready to go into combat. Give me some trials real quick. I mean, I want to test my proficiency. I want to test to see if I'm ready to go into the fight. You start talking with the Lord like that, and he'll help you. <laughs> he'll help you. He'll test some things. It's, it's so amazing how he does it, though, because he tests you with things that he knows you can handle, but he knows that you're going to handle it incorrectly. 
And we have to be humble enough to say, wow, I kind of blew that. My response wasn't anything like what I thought it was going to be. Okay, okay, so here's what I need to do now. And you get more discipline because you're, now you're, you're beyond the, the developmental stage and the, you're still digesting, you're able to digest food properly. And now it's the discipline stage. Like, okay, here's how I'm going to make some modifications, some changes, and let's, let's do this again. I remember praying to the Lord. I thought I had it down pretty good. This is before I was... Uh, pastoring is about three years into my Christian walk, studying the Word of God. I had now read the whole Bible about five times, studying each chapter different times. Had it was in, involved in seminary, so we were studying books at that time. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking I'm doing good. I'm doing good. I was teaching at two. I was teaching two Bible studies a week at nursing homes. This is where I got to preach. I got to tell somebody. I got too much in me. I got to share it with somebody. So they wheel people in there. They couldn't even get away. <laughs> I was like, amen, <laughs> hallelujah. I had one lady on a, on a bed. I brought her in on a, just, you know, her bed. I was like, how you doing? Welcome. I'll tell you what was, a, was an absolute blessing from that. I remember there was one gentleman, uh, he was in a wheelchair, and he became the house evangelist. He'd go room to room to room telling people about the Lord. I remember one lady giving her life to Christ one week before she died. She had horrible anxiety. She was always scared. She was horrified of death. Went in, gave her life, she gave her life to Christ. She started ministering to others that last week, room to room, before she went to be with the Lord. Very powerful. And I'm thinking, man, I'm seeing the fruit. This is good. This is great. I think I've got a lot of this down, Lord. So there's a passage of scripture that we were studying together as a group in Psalm. Try me, O Lord. Know my thoughts. See if there's any wicked way in me. Try me. My emphasis was on try me, Lord. I'm doing pretty good. Try me. Try this. I got some stuff going on now. Try me. Everything was pulled away from me absolute just bombs going off in my life, decimation, families fragmenting, finances. I mean, it was, okay, you're doing pretty good. Let's see how you react to this. (laughs) Almost killed me. (laughs) And I said, okay, Lord. So now that we've got some of that pride knocked down... (laughs) I'm not going to do that again. <laughs> Point made, taken. All right. You know what I started realizing after that? Is the more I learned about God, the less I knew about God. It's like he gave me a whole different level and a whole different look. And I started, I was like, oh. And I was like, oh, oh. Oh, man. That's bigger than I even know how to think. And God said, yes, you're a finite. You have a finite mind at this point in time. I created you. And you're trying to understand me, and I'm infinite. So it's kind of, our our minds are kind of the box. That's why it's so important for us to to study and and even I think it's great to go out and witness and and hear different testimonies and and see different things and go to different countries and and see different cultures and 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 allow your mind to be expanded so that you can just grasp and reach at, at who God is sometimes. A little bit easier. See, some people think they've got them all figured out. I've got God all figured out. I know him. And, and I, I've got him, he's all right here. There he is. Height, width, depth, breadth, got it, good. And he says, height never stops. Amen. Depth never stops. Amen. Width never stops. Amen. Breadth is, is, is thinking of, let's go into another dimension now. <laughs> go to a four dimension. And you're like, what is going on? <laughs> it's amazing. God is amazing. <laughs> so, 
so here's, here's what we're going to do. Obviously, from time to trials, time, trials, then you go into this transition like we just talked about, where you kind of go from faith to faith to this next level. And then you're really able to dive into some of the mysteries of the word of God. I want to see us go through this progression. But I'm going to ask you a question. And this is a rhetorical question. If the Holy Spirit convicts you over it, then let it happen. How many have read the book of Mark? All the ones that did raised their hand and you're basically telling on everybody. I said it was rhetorical. <laughs> the ones that said, I can't lie here. <laughs> that wouldn't be good. <laughs> hey, listen, that was just a basic little trial back a month ago when I said, hey, do this. It'll be good for you. It's good food. Can you feed yourself or do you need me to feed you every single Sunday? Feed yourself. Feed yourself a good meal of the book of Mark over the course of this week and tell me if it doesn't make a huge difference in your life. I do that because I love you. But I also, as your pastor, I wanna try to just, you know, are you going to do these things? Because if we start getting some serious stuff, you're gonna choke on it. You're just not gonna get it. It's, it's gonna be something like, I don't understand, that's over my head, or, you know, I, that, he's gone off his rocker talking about this fourth dimension or second dimension and demons and all these other things, and, you know, that's crazy talk. Just give them some medication. <laughs> I don't think we're gonna have a problem here with that. That is a problem, though, in our nation. So transition. So here's, here's the progression that we're going to initiate and, and we'll have classes and, and we're going to, to have times of prayer and worshipful prayer. And, and I don't know how long it's gonna take. I mean, I, could, I would love to get lost in prayer to God as a group to where we're not really paying attention to time anymore because it doesn't matter. But here's going to be the progression. People are going to get saved. People are going to get saved. We have got to have something in place to not just leave them there. They've given their life to Christ. We're talking to them on the street. And it's like, man, are you excited? Yeah, well, go home, read your Bible, and good luck. That is not biblical evangelism. That is asking to have uh, this new birth be aborted. Now, I say that if they've truly given their life to Christ, then they have, but they can get very jaded very quickly because they don't have... I mean, could you imagine leaving an infant? Oh, you just had a baby? That's wonderful. Let's just set her out here and hopefully she does pretty good. Hope she figures it out and the ants don't eat her. <laughs> you wouldn't do that. We shouldn't do it either. So as we go out and evangelize and are ministering to people, we should have something of a resource. Obviously, come to church. Don't be afraid to say, let me get your number. Here's mine. I'll call you. I'll pick you up Sunday. Now, what I forgot to tell you is about baptism. Baptism. If that scares them off and they're like, well, I don't know, I didn't sign up for any of that stuff and I didn't do all this other stuff, then don't think that you made a convert. That's right. Because they should now desire, if the Holy Spirit has now entered into their life, they should desire the things of God. It should be, Lester, what am I supposed to do next? Oh, man, I'm so glad you asked. Listen, I'm gonna come pick you up on Sunday. You're gonna come to church. You're gonna meet Pastor Eric. You're gonna meet a lot of great folks. It's gonna be exciting. It's a family. It's really good. And then you'll get baptized. Oh, really? Should I invite my, my family? Absolutely. This is gonna be your public declaration of what's already happened in your life. And we're gonna pray that all the demons and everything else fall off of you and that you're filled to overflowing with the Holy Spirit of God. Let me tell you about the Holy Spirit. Do you have time for coffee? It's discipleship. That's what it should be. Now, as a resource, 
I want to give you this. This I want you to read, or we can meet daily and I'll read it with you, or we can do it over the phone. Something along these lines where you're helping them with some milk along the way because I'll guarantee you what's going to happen. Their parents are going to come against them. Their friends are going to turn against them. Their finances are going to fall apart. Their car is going to break down. All kinds of things are going to start happening in their life. And if they don't have anybody there, they're going to go, this God thing, I thought I gave my life to you. And God forbid if we start telling them that you're going to have a better life now. My goodness. (laughs) I didn't know troubles till I got saved. (laughs) I mean, I don't remember having as many problems (laughs) before I got saved. You know why? Because you're walking with Satan. And he's kind of just guiding you and leading you. You don't run into overwhelming issues. Sometimes you do. But I tell you what, when you get saved, you do that 180, and you're going to run into Satan. You're going to run into demons. You're going to run into that force that was pushing you because now you're going in the opposite direction. That's reality. That's reality. So salvation, baptism, community groups, friendships, Develop through some kind of a community group where you're meeting at a home during the course of a week. And this is something that we really need to look at doing. I'm planning on selling. I want to sell all my stuff and get a different place that's closer so that we can have stuff that's totally conducive for for these kind of fellowships because we should be hospitable. At the same time, we need to be cautious when you open your home. We gotta have wisdom. We've gotta have discernment. You know, somebody gives their life to Christ, it's wonderful, invite them over to the home. Um, they may have something on them. But I'll tell you right now, they walk into that home, it should be sanctified, ready for the work of Christ, and that demon might just go, <clears throat> you go on in, I'm gonna hang out here. <laughs> I just, I'm just gonna hang out here with these, these guys here. We'll see you in a minute. <laughs> Amen. That's how it should be. Or they come walking up and they're like, oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's huge. That angel is, I'm, I'm gonna hang out over here. And they start to feel freedom. They're like, man, I feel freedom when I'm coming here. That's how it should be. We don't need to be bringing any demons in our home. We don't need to be bringing them to our church. We should have so much discernment that somebody comes in and we look around and if somebody comes in and they're sitting in the back and they're like, hey, come on. Do you see this? <laughs> all right? I had a gentleman one time sitting up front. And I was preaching. And he seemed like he was all interested. You know, he was looking at me. He's all interested. I was like, man, this guy, we might see him again on another Sunday. <clears throat> Within 15 minutes after the service, he was laid out in the lobby, demon being cast out of him, of the hotel that we're meeting in. And right before the invitation, right before I got serious in this particular message, he walked out. And I, hmm, that was interesting. Strange time to leave. <laughs> Discernment. Discernment. So even the community groups, you know, when we go for lunch, that's part of this community. We get to know each other. We get to have conversations and talk. And, and even these, in these house uh, home fellowship groups, uh, we're going to study the Word of God. We're going to get to know each other, and you're going to make friendships. You're going to have somebody to call on when things get tough. And I tell you right now, in our society today, it's tough to make friends. Sadly enough, some of the friends that we've made in the past, they were our worst enemies. You know what I mean? And so we get this guard up. We're like, I don't want to really invite a lot of folks into my life because I'm going to get hurt. And uh, when I was talking with... Uh, uh, Dr. Hovind yesterday. Uh, I was just admiring how he can overcome those deep stabs in the back and in the heart and in the throat and all kinds of other stuff. I'm speaking spiritually. <laughs> he didn't go through all that physically, but he just keeps coming back saying, I'm just serving the Lord. I'm just going to serve the Lord. That's what he told me to do. Just keep serving the Lord. No matter what happens, just keep serving him. This will be over. This will be over soon. Just keep serving. Don't don't fall short. Just keep going. 
Just keep going. And he's got such a joy, and that's what I want. I want to have that. But I also want to have a lot more discernment. And he admitted he wanted that too. (laughs) So from that, we go into discipleship. That's where discipleship will actually take place. Does that make sense? Now, this is all biblical. I mean, they met in homes, and then there was discipleship that took place from that point. And then from this, you can start to see the ones that have... So we did the spiritual gifts test. I don't have them all in. I'm assessing them now. But you did it. If you did it, you know what yours are, right? You feel pretty good. You're like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Oh, yeah, that's good. One, two, three, that's nice. How do I apply this? Keep asking yourself that question because we're going to talk about it, and we should be able to come up with something as, as we go and grow. Amen? So utilizing your gifts. If you haven't taken the gifts test, then I'll have bibs here for you next week. I'm just saying, we need to do these things. This is part of the growth. I want us to move along. Now, here's the deal. We may come across somebody who's challenged with certain things, and and it's, it's stunting their ability to grow. And then we can identify that and we can get through it. And my wife, I love her. She's smart, and she actually has a, a phenomenal discernment. Um, very specific. It's kind of like a sniper discernment. I like it. Um, I'm just now starting to listen to it, but you know, (laughs) but there was a time where I'm, I'm skyrocketing in the word and she's falling behind and kind of struggling. And I was like, what's going on? She's like this King James, this D thou stuff. It's just, I'm I'm not able to, to grab hold of it. It, It's, it's kind of confusing me to where I can't remember what I'm reading. And I said, well, ask the Holy Spirit to give you new eyes, to reveal his word, your desire, a genuine from your heart prayer to God that I want to understand this. And I remember it was probably the next day. Do you remember? Was it the next day? It was very shortly thereafter, wasn't it? She was all excited. And all of a sudden, the word of God just opened up to her to where she understood it. I mean, where she could just, she said, oh, yeah, even just, just reading. It's like, it, it makes you excited when you see God do something. You knew that that was blocking you, and all of a sudden, it's like, boom. It's like, oh, it's like, oh, oh he's doing something. <laughs> Isn't that exciting when you see God doing something in your life? But this is where, ultimately, through discipleship, we're going to have leadership training, and then we'll be able to designate ministry leaders. We see that in the early church. There were men that are appointed over certain things. You see that there was deacon and deaconesses. You see that there was uh, husband and wife teams working together uh, in their home, in the church that was in their home. Uh, these are the things where we start to, to see that kind of leadership come from. And we need leadership. And I'm not the top-down guy. I used to be a top-down guy where I'm just gonna, I've got to oversee everything. I got to make sure that everything's going squared away. And the Lord said, you're not gonna be able to do nothing You can only do so much when you have that, right? The bottom down is where you're carrying the burden and trying to do everything. And I'm more guilty of trying to do that myself and you can't do it either. You can't, one person cannot carry the whole load and every little thing. It needs to be delegated out to competent people. So what if you stand beside it, kind of like a triangle, if you think by the top of the triangle, that's the top down, Holding that big base up all by yourself is tough. A lot of people do that in their life, in their families, in their careers, everything. They're just like, I got this. No, 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 I'm fine. Yeah, no, you're not. (laughs) Get somebody to help you that's competent. Don't be the control freak over the whole thing. But stand off to the side and you see this triangle here? Grow it with leadership. Make it stronger. That's where I want to be, off the side. I want to stand by your side and help develop and see and grow. And next thing you know, from this leadership training, the, uh, the, the ministry leaders, we're going to have theological and leadership training classes that those folks will attend and be a part of. And from this, we're going to have one Tuesday night where a couple comes up to me, and I'm so looking forward to this. And they go, Pastor... We've been called to be missionaries. We've, we've been called to plant a church. It'll be like, cross line, listen, this is exciting. 
And then we support them. And we plant them. And we go and visit them and get them resources that they need and expand the gospel, even if that is in Houston. Right? Been called to plant a church in Houston. It's like, let's pray. <laughs> That's gonna be a tough one. <laughs> anyway, that was the third point. There's still a fourth one. We'll talk about that next week. Are you getting this? I mean, do you feel it? Do you see it? Don't you want this to be part of it? I don't know of other churches that, that are talking like this, that are, that are planning like this, that are being strategic, that are in understanding. I don't want to leave anybody behind. Amen? So these things that, that you're asked to do, because we're going to end up going back into the book of Mark, because there's a lot of lessons for us to learn in the book of Mark. I need you to read it. If you haven't read it yet, take the time to read it. Take the time to download it and listen to it while you're driving. You know, at least, at least do that. I think the more senses, if you listen to it and read it, you're involving two senses and you'll retain more. And if you lick the paper, it's in another sense. No. <laughs> okay, maybe you don't have to do that. It's got, I've got my scratch and sift King James Bible. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he stinketh. Oh, next chapter. Next week, we're going to talk about the assignment. So if you have gotten the spiritual gifts test and you haven't done it, do it this week. It's real simple. It calculates all the numbers for you. You just have to send it back. That's it. You know, it does all the work. Now, make a copy for yourself. Print it out. Understand it. It has definitions. It's really good. Read the book of Mark. I'm telling you what, if you know your gifts and you can get some of that in you, the good word this week, you'll come back next week and you'll feel stronger so you can take on more. And here's the neat thing, when you start to build up an appetite for the word of God, you want it more and more and more and more and more. And when you exercise what you're studying you become like a, a furnace, a consuming fire. And that's what the Lord wants us to be. Amen? Amen? For his glory. Father, we thank you for your word, Lord. We ask for your blessing over it, Lord, that the seed was sown, and Lord, that it's planted deeply and it'll grow roots. Father, I ask that you would water this, Holy Spirit, water this seed. Lord, continue to, uh, to expand the vision for this body of believers at Cross Life. And Lord, that ultimately we will actually be encouragers to other churches. We will be a ministry support because we're training up the leadership that they're lacking. And Lord, I thank you for, uh, for the ministry partners that will be coming soon to us and the network that you're already creating Father, we thank you in advance for that. And Lord, we thank you for the men and women that we raised up in leadership to help support those ministries and not just this. Because Lord, this is your body and we want to be a part of that. Help us to do that in Jesus' name. And God's people said, amen. amen.